From Medina. At the hardware store. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Been a fortnight. Yeah. 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 Anyway, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. You had to do a hundred. How's your day going? Good. How's your day? Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good. Not too bad. Not too bad. Back with another Bible study. Yep. Worked on this one for a little bit. Trying to get all the puzzle pieces together with God's leading. Anyways, let's say hi to my mom. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Kiwi. Hi, Ming. Hi, Don. Dolores, Victoria, Ed, Felicia, Emily, Ray Fouché. Yeah. Um, everybody, hello. Hope you're doing well. We're doing pretty good. It's hot out. It is. It's Transitioning good. into that summer weather. It says it's 100 out here. I On don't believe car, it. car, it yeah. says it's 100. That's crazy. It feels pretty hot. It's pretty hot. Any, I'm a polar bear. I like the winter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't too good in the summer. Well, you live in the right place then. Yeah. It's like winter six months out of the year yeah, yeah. here. So. <laughs> so are you ready to pray and start the Bible study? I'm ready. All right, let's pray. Let me take my hat off. Heavenly Father, thank you for opportunity to pray with my wife and with our family on the internet. We ask that you'd fill us with your spirit, speak through us, hide us in your hand, and just help us, Lord, to understand the different things that you would have us to understand as we get to know you, uh, you better. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, everybody. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, the Heacocks, hello. Jay, Clarissa, and your little cutie, hello. So today we're going to talk about the moral monster of the Old Testament. Uh, this is going to be a tough one in the sense that we're so used to seeing God in the Old Testament be a moral monster. But is it really him or is somebody counterfeiting the position and standing in the place of God? Uh, pretending to be God and deceiving us through satanic principles. This, uh, that's what we're going to study today. First John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. Key component to understanding the Bible and understanding God is that God is love. God is agape. Psalm 18, verse 30 says God is perfect. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. And if you know that God is agape, and if you know that God, uh, God is perfect and unchangeable, then when you see something in the Bible that doesn't line up with God's perfect, unchangeable character of agape, you can question it, and you should, and say, "Is God, is this really you? We got three core Bible study principles. We always use them. Core principle number one, God is agape. 1 Corinthians 13 is the agape chapter. It describes agape for us very well. And when you juice that down, you see three components. One is self-control. One is considering others more important than you consider yourself. And what, another component is that agape isn't personally offended by sin. This is exactly who God is. Our second core Bible study principle is that Jesus is the complete an ultimate revelation of God. If you want to know what the Father is actually like, you need to look into the face of Jesus. John 14, 9. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Our third core Bible study principle is that biblical principle explains the scriptures and scripture explains biblical principle. Isaiah 28, verse 10 says, for precept, biblical principle, must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And today's Bible study, we're going to talk about the moral monster of the Old Testament. And then you look at the Old Testament, there is a, absolutely a moral monster overseeing God's people. And is this the one true God, the Father, the Father of Jesus? Or is this Satan standing in the place of God, pretending to be God? In the last Bible study, we talked about the character, the method, and the principles of Satan. And what we saw was that Scripture was explaining Satan in a specific way. We saw that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, that he was a deceiver. We saw in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, that he was an accuser. We saw in Revelation, or excuse me, we saw in John chapter 8, verse 44, that Satan was a liar and a murderer. 
we saw in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 that Satan can transform into an angel of light. These are all important passages. We generally know these passages. I don't need to read every single one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says that Satan has the power to use lying signs and wonders. All of these things are very important when it comes to reading the Old Testament because when you see a being who's accusing, who's lying, who's murdering, who's doing all these signs and wonders in the place of God, in the name of God, and it completely contradicts the character of God's agape love, we need to really question, is this God or Satan? And there are verses in the Bible that show us that this could actually be Satan. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we saw the temptation when Satan was interacting with Jesus. And the thing that we saw last Bible study was that Satan knew the scriptures very well, but he was twisting them in such a way that he was causing or trying to cause Jesus to no longer view scripture from God's perspective, but he wanted Jesus to view scripture in a selfish way, a self-centered way. Jesus refused to do it. And so each one of these passages, New Testament passages, and all of these are warnings about the character of Satan, right? About how Satan lies, how he deceives, how he transforms himself into something that he is not an angel of light, an angel of God, so that he can twist, warp, and deceive us into un misunderstanding God and misunderstanding the scriptures. These are all New Testament passages, and in, these are warnings in the New Testament. And if these New Testament passages, which warn us to be careful of Satan, sh wouldn't Satan be able to do the same things to people in the Old Testament? It's very important to ask that question. And I believe that he was able to. And I believe that the Bible tells us how to see Satan masquerading as an angel of light in the Old Testament. So, Mark chapter 3, verse 22. Mark chapter 3, verse 22 says this. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said he, Jesus, hath Beelzebub, Satan, the prince of devils, casts out he devils. So the, uh, the scribes were saying that Jesus casts out devils by the spirit of devils. And this is Jesus' response. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? Now that's a question, right? How? Can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against Satan, he will be divided. He cannot stand, but hath an end. So Jesus is not saying, which we commonly assume, that Satan can't cast himself out. That's what we all believe. Satan can't cast himself out. Jesus is saying that this is something that Satan does, but because Satan does this, there's an end that's going to come. So Satan casts himself out through the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this is what's called order out of chaos, right? The knowledge of good and evil has two sides. It has a good side, which is satanic, and it has an evil side which is satanic and through the knowledge of good and evil the good side creates the order which the evil side creates the chaos and the good side of Satan's system casts out the evil side this is order out of chaos Satan first incites and instigates the chaos through the supposed evil and then he rises up as an agent of order through the good side to stop the chaos that he created. So both the order and the chaos, which um, probably a lot of us know about order out of chaos. It's uh, the secret societies use this principle to govern over mankind. It's the uh, Hegelian dialectic. It's um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Both of these each side. They seem like they oppose each other. They don't. 
both sides are the character method and principles of Satan. One simply represents the good side in the knowledge of evil, and the other represents the evil side in the knowledge of good and evil. But both sides are the character, method, and the principles of Satan. So both are satanic. So when Jesus says, can Satan cast out Satan? Yes, but for Satan to successfully cast himself out while consolidating or holding on to his power, he has to present himself in a way where he doesn't seem as if he is Satan, the deceiver, the liar, the murderer. He has to present himself as an angel of light. And so once people believe that the order through the chaos, once they believe that the order which is being established is actually from God, then Satan can introduce different satanic principles to people and they will think that these principles come from God. So this is the foundation of today's Bible study, is that Satan, who is the ruler and king of all those who live by the knowledge of good and evil. It's a double-sided system. He uses order out of chaos. He uses the good to oversee the evil, to deceive and to lie about the character, the method, and the principles of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, we know this all probably by heart by now, but that there's a veil over the New Testament. This veil is a satanic covering so that we cannot see the character of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 says this, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. We've done a lot of Bible studies on this. Most of us who come to these Bible studies understand that you have to read the Old Testament through the revelation of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4.4 uh, 4 continues on about talking about the veil. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So there is the satanic veil over the Old Testament. It directly comes from Satan, and it's a result of not believing the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a very peculiar passage in Exodus 23, 20, and 21. This is actually a warning from the one true God about an angel that is about to rule over his people. Let's read this, and let's see something very interesting. Exodus 23, 20, and 21. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now, this is a warning. God is telling his people, be, be careful. There is an angel over you. Do not provoke him. He will not forgive your sins. And he also says, my name is in him. Now, it's pretty clear here that God is warning the children of Israel that an evil angel is about to be over them. Now, before we talk about why this is an evil angel, we want to ask the question, why would God allow this to take place? And for those of you who are familiar with um, King Saul, the people demanded a king. God was their king, but the people did not want God as their king, so they demanded a king. And after God warned them about the consequences of having a human king, the people still demanded a king, so God allowed it. But later on in the scriptures, and I believe it's Hosea 13.10, it says, In my anger I gave them a king. But 
God didn't actually give the people a king. It's what the people wanted. So as we begin to investigate, we're going to see what kind of God the people of Israel who come out of Egypt actually want. And we're going to see that their preconceived ideas about the God that they wanted enabled Lucifer to step into the place of God. Exodus 15, 1 through 3. Now, Exodus 15 is right after the children of Israel cross the sea. And here we go. So that they just cross the sea. Moses begins to sing a song about the God in whom he believes in. Then sang, let's go back 1 to 14. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Exodus 15, 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song unto the Lord, spake, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown in the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare, prepare him a habitation my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now this is who Moses and the people thought God was, a God of war. That's a God of death, a God of destruction, a God of conquering. But that's not who God is. We can say that now with the revelation of Jesus and an understanding of God's agape love. But to Moses and the children of Israel, God was a conquering God. He would destroy, he would kill anybody who did not do his will. So from Moses' perspective, in Exodus 15, God is a God of war. He's a God who destroys. Exodus 20, 17 to 19. Now this is literally right after the Ten Commandments is given. Exodus 20, 17. And we're going to talk, we're going to say the 10th commandment, and they're going to go into immediately what takes place. Exodus 20, 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The next verse. And all the people saw the lightnings and thunders and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain and the smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us. We will hear you, but let not God speak to us, lest we die. And so what we see in these two passages is a misconception about the character of God thinking that God is a a God of war, a God of destruction, a God of murder. And then once the Ten Commandments are given, which is a revelation of God's character, it's a character of love, the people are afraid of God and they no longer want to talk to him. Now this is a very important about the heads of protection and the deceiver coming in and taking the place of the God that they believe he God is, a God of war. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is a hedge of protection that protects us because God's word are literally the life-giving words that make life possible. When we reject God and his words, there's a, a, a hedge of protection that is broken down. And once that takes place, Satan is able to come in. And once he comes in, he is the one who will destroy. This is exactly what Ecclesiastes 10.8 says. Ecclesiastes 10, I went a little far. Ecclesiastes 10.8. He that digs a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaks a hedge, a serpent shall bite. So once the people reject God, Literally, immediately after the Ten Commandments, a hedge of protection is broken down, and Satan begins to step in. And what we see in Exodus 23 is God articulating that this is what's taking place. 
Now, there is this verse, which we should address it, Psalm 78, 14. It can seem like God is the one who is sending evil angels. And sometimes that's how the Bible phrases it. But we're going to see that it's a misunderstanding of people as they wrote. And that there's deeper revelations of the character of God as we journey through Scripture. Psalm 78, 14 says, shh, 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 Psalm 78, 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger and wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. That's what the Bible says. And it's hard to discuss with people what literally the Bible says. It literally says God sent evil angels. So you have to know the character of God. This is why understanding the character of God is so important. Because God, who is perfect and unchangeable, will never do anything outside of his character. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says this. 1 Corinthians 13.5. Agape. This is the love chapter. Agape does not behave itself inappropriately. Agape does not think its own. Agape is not easily provoked. Agape thinks no evil. Now, Psalm 78, 49 says that God sent evil angels among them. That cannot be true. Because for God to send evil angels means that he had to think to do that. Right? You can't do something unless you think about it first. And when you look at the revelation of God in his son, Jesus Christ, it's very clear. That God does not ever think any evil thoughts nor can he send evil upon people. But whoever wrote Psalm 78, 49, he had a misconception of God. The full revelation of God was not there. He had a partial understanding, right? And so as we know Agape, as we see what God is like in the face of Jesus Christ, we can say that God definitely did not send evil angels. But the people were putting themselves in a position where the, a hedge of protection was broken down and God allowed the evil angels to come. The same way that the Bible says that God gave them a king, but he didn't. It's what the people wanted. And we saw the mindset of the people. They wanted a God of war, right? They didn't want, they didn't want to actually talk to God. So did God allow evil angels to come? He did. But he was giving them warnings of what was about to play, take place. God warned the people that a destroying angel would come in his name. Now that's important because just because something comes in your name doesn't mean that it's from you. Matthew 24, 5. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5 says this. For many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Right? People come in Christ's name saying that they are Christ, but it's a deception. This was a prophecy of what the future would happen in the future. How Satan will absolutely do the same thing in the past. We just have to have the critical thinking, the leading of the Spirit, to be able to see it. So, we have the children of Israel desiring a God of war. We have the children of Israel not wanting to have a direct connection to God. And then we have a warning in Exodus 23 that there is an angel coming that you need to be aware of. You need to be very careful because he will hurt you. And he's going to come in my name. Just because he comes in the name of God does not mean he represents God's angel or does not mean that he represents God. And when you look in the Bible, the holy angels of God always line up their character with the character of the Father. Now, this is important. The word holy means complete. It means undivided. So to have a holy character simply means that they have a, an unbroken character. It's not divided. It's one in the sense that it's complete agape because that's what they... Um, receive from the Father. And when you, let's look at some passages, and we'll see that the angels 
the good holy angels, are in unity with the character of God. Second Peter chapter two verse ten. Second Peter chapter two verse ten says. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh, in the lust of uncleanness, and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. So, God's angels, they're not accusers. Satan is the accuser. And when we look at actually what the angels participate in. They participate in the full character of God's agape love. Isaiah 6, 5. So the angels don't, the good angels don't accuse. Only the satanic ones accuse. Isaiah 6, verse 5. Isaiah 6 5 woe then said I woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts then flew one of the seraphims that's an angel unto me having a live coal in his hand which he had taken from the tongs of the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this hath touched thy lips thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin is purged so God's holy angels play their part in relaying the message of forgiveness. This is going to be important because in a minute, when we look back at that Exodus 23 passage about the, the, the evil angel, this angel is not a holy angel. This angel, if it was a holy angel, then it would not have done the things or led the people in the way which we're going to see. Matthew sixteen twenty seven. Matthew sixteen twenty seven. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. Now that glory is the character. When you look at Exodus thirty three and thirty four, Moses asks God, Show me your glory. And what God shows Moses is his character. So whenever you see that word glory, it's always connected to the character. For the Son of Man shall come in the character of his Father with his angels. Then shall he reward every man according to his works. So we, three, we see th three things. We see the Father, the Son, and the angels. These three are coming together because they're united in the same character of God's agape love. Because these holy angels participate in the character, the method, and the principles of God's agape love. So at the second coming, they come united with Christ in the same glory, which is just a revelation that they're coming with the same character. Now, we're going to see, can these good angels and these bad angels, can they both do the work of God? Amos chapter 3, 3. Joel, Amos 3, 3 says this. Can two walk together um, except they be agreed? That's important because you have Satan and his angels and you have Jesus and the Father's angels. And the Bible says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? And it, it gets deeper. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? It's pretty easy that whatever was happening in the Old Testament, which it can be hard to understand, these evil angels, which were over God's people, in the name of God, these were not God's holy angels. Let's read Exodus 23 again. Exodus 23, 20. Exodus 
Now this is after the children of Israel rejected a personal connection to God. This is after they sang a song to the God of war. This is after the, the Ten Commandments. This is a warning. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee in the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not. He will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. Now, this angel is not the same character of God. This angel is looking to punish. This angel is looking for sin. It's important to understand the pretext behind some of the things we're going to read in a minute. If, if you're walking with this angel and you sin, he's going to look for your sin and he is going to look to punish you. This angel is the fallen angel Lucifer, the one who deceives people by coming in God's name, pretending to be someone he is not. And there is absolutely evidence of this taking place in the Bible. So let's look at some scriptural passages where in one place it says God for sure did this. And then later, after different revelations take place, it says, no, this was absolutely Satan. 2 Samuel 24, 1. Second Samuel 24, 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against David, and he moved again, and excuse me, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go and number Israel and Judah. That's an important passage. Because it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David to do something which would have been a pretext to punish Israel. So this passage is saying Israel didn't wasn't doing anything wrong, but God moved David because he just wanted to hurt Israel. That's 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 important. The character of God's agape love should cause us to question this. First Chronicles 21 1. First Chronicles, I'm in Second Chronicles. Same story. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now this can be a hard pill to swallow because we want to have the Old Testament be something so pure that it's not something that we have to worry about knowing if it's God or Satan. But that's not the reality that we have to deal with. There's an angel who comes in the name of God deceiving people, even God's people. And we see in one place, God gets the blame for something. And then in another place, they say that was actually Satan. This takes place multiple times in the Bible the Old Testament, and we just have to have a willingness to understand that the Bible is not a complete and full revelation of God. It's partial. Jesus is the complete and full revelation of God. So there is evidence, and there is more evidence that in one spot it says that God did this, but in another spot it says it was actually Satan. Second Kings 1.10 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10. So the backdrop is that Elijah is sitting on a mountain and the king sends his people to get him. And Elijah doesn't want to go and he says, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. That's the backdrop. Verse 10, And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And again also he went unto another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. 
and fire of God came down from the heaven and consumed them in his 50. And when you read this passage, it is the, the natural assumption that this took place because Elijah was approved by God to send fire on these 50. But Jesus gives us the true and ultimate revelation of what was actually happening. Luke chapter 9, 51. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, John and James, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he, Jesus, turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner ye of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, this has to be a, a revelation of something that was taking place with Elijah than what we had preconceived thought. It says that the fire of God came down and consumed the 50, so we thought that this came from God. But Jesus says that that does not come from the spirit of God's agape love. It's another spirit. And we know that it's not the holy angels that would do that because they're in unity with the Father's character. And the only other spirit that sends fire from heaven is Satan. And we have biblical evidence for it. Job chapter 1. Now, a lot of us know all of this, and I'm slightly repeating some things. But the context, the precedence for what I'm saying is important, and it's here. Job chapter 1, verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Hast thou blessed the work of his hands and the substance in his hand is in, in the substance of his hand is increased in the land? But put forth thine hand now, touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to the face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only upon himself. Put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when the sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding besides them. And the Sabians fell upon them, took them away. Yes, they have slain thy servants with the edge of the sword. And I am only escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is come, has fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and has consumed them. So, the fire that comes down to consume men's lives is Satan. God gets the blame. But there is absolutely more than enough evidence throughout the Old Testament that in one place it says that God did it, but in another place it says that God did not do it. And we have a choice to make. We can either believe the actual words of Jesus, right? Or we can just go by our own reasoning and say, no, I want a God of war. I want a God who destroys men's lives. But Satan is a deceiver. He's deceived the whole world into thinking that God is to something that he is not. So we need to really make a choice. Either I'm going to be my own deciding factor of what the character of God is, or I need to let Jesus do that. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. There's not a greater revelation of God but in the face of Jesus. If I supersede the words of Jesus and I go to define God in my own, then the deception which Satan has introduced into the world has fallen upon my mind. That's just a reality check. And there's 
many, many passages, many passages in the Bible that sh it's actually Satan doing the work. One of those passages that I wanted to talk about was the story of Joshua and Achan. Now, again, there's a lot of passages, but there's a specific satanic principle being displayed in Joshua chapter 7. This is why I want to focus on the story of Joshua and Achan, because in this story, again, there's a lot of other stories, but specifically this one, this is where Satan uses order out of chaos, right? There's a specific chaos that is created because of the sin of Achan, and what Satan introduces, taking the place of God, is something that's very diabolical, and we end up attributing a satanic principle to God. And what we're going to see is that in the story of Joshua and Achan, that this is actually Satan casting out Satan. It's the scapegoat mechanism, which by God's grace, that will be the next Bible study. But what we're going to see is that there's a chaos, there's a conflict, and there's a resolution. This is what the scapegoat mechanism is all about. It's a satanic principle. And what we're going to see is that as Satan casts out Satan, there becomes a reason for a lack of blessing in the lives of people, which is the result of sin. This is the, this is the chaos. And when the person who is blamed for the sin or who is the cause of sin is exposed or decided upon, the, the, this unites the group of people around the source of chaos. And the person who brought the sin into the camp is blamed for the reason why there's no more blessing. He's responsible for the chaos. This unites the people to kill this person. This is pagan. This is this is the scapegoat mechanism. This is Satan casting out Satan. And because it's in the Bible, in the book of Joshua, we see that, we think that it's a, a, a biblical thing and okay. But with the revelation of Exodus 23, 20, and 21, an angel coming in the name of the Lord who's looking to punish, who's looking to do things that will go against the people, we can say, this is actually Satan doing this. So, order out of chaos, the scapegoat mechanism. There's going to be a con there's going to be chaos, there's going to be a conflict, and there's going to be a resolution. And it is all wrapped around the character, the method, and the principles of Satan. There's, there's nothing divine or agape in this scenario. So, Joshua chapter 7. Let's re read it quickly. Not the whole thing, but a good couple chunks. Joshua chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a sin in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the, of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, we can't forget that God told us of an angel that would not forgive the people of their sins and he would punish them and he would come in God's name. It's important. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai beside Beth Avon on the east side of Bethel and spake to them saying go and view the country and the men went up and viewed Ai and they returned to Joshua and said unto him let not all the people go up but about two or three thousand men go and kill Ai and make not all the people to labor there, but a few, and the men of Ai, and it says, so there went up about of the people 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. So there's a crisis. And the men of Ai smote them about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate, even to Sherbim, and smote them in the going down. Therefore the heart of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua tore his clothes, fell upon the earth, 
upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. And he and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwell on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear it and shall environ us around and cut us off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do, thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, therefore liest thou upon thy face. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I have commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and disassembled, and they have put it even among their stuff. So there's a conflict. There's a crisis taking place. And what God begins, what the person in the position of God begins to do, is he begins to point out specifically one individual for the reason for all this conflict, and it's only this one person in the camp which is sinning. It's impossible. It's literally impossible. And what we see in verse 16. So Joshua rose up in the morning. Let me go back one. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will they be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed thing among you. So important. And in the morning, therefore, ye... okay, so there's a crisis. The children of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. There's a sinner in the camp who did something he wasn't supposed to do. You can't have your blessings back until you destroy the accursed thing. This is vastly important. The crisis is that the blessings are no longer coming. There is a, an exposed villain, which is the source of the problem, and the only resolution is that you have to get rid of this problem. This, this is a completely a satanic principle being done in God's name with God's people, and when we read it, we think that this is how God acts. I used to literally, in church, when there was an issue in church, I would say, there's an Achan in the camp, we need to find them and get rid of them. So wrong and satanic. But it goes on. Verse 16. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribe, by the tribe of Judah. And he brought the family of Judah. And he took the family of the Zaharites. And he made the family of the Zaharites man by man. And Zabdi was taken. And he brought the household man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerai, of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, I pray thee, glory to the Lord of Israel, make confession unto him, and tell me what you have done. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord of God, and thus, thus have I done. And when I saw the spoils of a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, fifty shekels weight, I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Jump down to verse 25. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised up over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place is the Valley of Acre unto this day. This whole chapter is Satan expelling Satan. That's exactly what it is because there isn't a principle of God's agape love being used. It's the order that Satan wants. Satan wants you to be so obedient that doesn't matter if you're killing, but if I say don't touch this thing, you can't touch it. All the other sins, it doesn't matter. But if I say this is the thing to avoid, then this is to what you are to avoid. This is 
a satanic sleight of hand. As Satan stands in the place of God, using the name of God, he's promoting his character, his method, his principles among God's people. He's remaining hidden behind the name of God. And this is the satanic veil which Satan uses to stand in the place of God pretending to be God. And what Satan is doing is he's introducing a pagan idea into God's people. That the reason why your blessings are being hindered is because of the sinner that is among you. And you cannot have your blessings back until the sinner is destroyed. It's a scapegoat mechanism. It's paganism. And it's all done in God's name so that when people read it, they think that this is how God operates when it's absolutely not how God operates. And it's the truth is, it's only through the complete and total revelation of God in Jesus Christ can we see past the veil where Satan is hiding behind the name of God. This is the only way to see it. The true revelation of God is in Jesus. His character, his method, his principles are the character of the method and the principles of the Father. In the Old Testament, when you see anything contradicting the life of Christ, it's contradicting the life of God and it's not God. It's Satan imitating God, right? In the Old Testament, we see Satan imitating God, but Satan isn't imitating God the same way that Jesus imitates God. Jesus' imitation of God is perfect, it's beautiful, and it's always God's agape love. Satan's imitation in the Old Testament is the spirit of arrogance, it's the spirit of pride, it's the spirit of vengeance and rivalry for power. It's Satan's imitation of God in the Old Testament is jealous, it's perverted, it's grotesque in its revelation of the character. It's contrary to everything that God and agape love stands for. Satan's imitation of God in the Old Testament is a counterfeit. It's by design to introduce satanic principles in the name of God thinking that they come from God. In the Old Testament, Satan mimics God and his laws. That's without a doubt a reality. But he does it not to promote them. He does it to twist them because he wants to pervert our understanding of them. So you can have the Ten Commandments when it comes to Satan, but what you can't have is the agape love that's the core essence of them. This is Satan's perverted imitation of God. And it has the main goal of deceiving the world into believing that God is mean, critical, and warlike. But so is his law. And so Satan wants this veil over the Old Testament. So that when people read the Old Testament and they read these type of things in the Bible, that they end up following God out of fear, out of manipulation, out of coercion. This a completely wrong mindset to worshiping the one true God. You actually cannot worship the one true God through fear, through manipulation, through coercion. You can have all the right information, but the motivation behind why you're doing it, if it's not agape, it's not good. And so what we have in Jesus is the truth. And I say this sometimes, is that there's a written word which is the Bible. It's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. But there's a living word which is Jesus Christ. And the living word always tells us how to read the written word. So in essence, the written word is subject to the living word. John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. It's, not, it's, it's so simple, it's easy to miss. God the Father is just like Jesus. John chapter 12, 44. John chapter 12, verse 44. 
And Jesus cried and said, He that believes on me believes not on me, but on him that sent me. He that has seen me sees him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. That darkness comes from this lies of Satan. John chapter 1 verse 5. Let's read it. First John chapter 1 verse 5. This probably be our last verse. First John chapter 1 verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That is such an important statement that in God is no darkness. Darkness is death. Darkness is hatred. Darkness is lies. In God there is no death. There is no hatred. There is no lies. God is not the accuser of the brethren who points out one sin and prevents all blessings throughout the entire community until this one person is destroyed by the community. Satanic principles being done in the name of God to promote a satanic agenda. Right? The Bible says that in God is no darkness. Right? The Bible says, 1 John 4, 4, 8, that God is love. God is agape. And so once we understand the character, the method, the principles of God's agape love, and once we understand the character, the method, and the principles of Satan through the knowledge of good and evil and how there is a counterfeit goodness, which is not agape, then we can understand when we read the Old Testament that this couldn't be God because God would never do such a thing. He would never say such a thing. If this isn't agape, if it's not a revelation of what Jesus did as the divine son of God, then I have to question what is going on here. God is like Jesus, always patient, always kind, always forgiving, always merciful, always gracious. But there was an angel which was allowed over God's people. The same today is this the same as it's always been. Right? There's a hedge of protection around us. It's critical to stay in that. Because when we come out, there's only one being over us. That's Satan. And if we're not careful, the same thing will happen in our lives as it did theirs. That the character, method, and principles of Satan, which are done in the name of God, will deceive us. And will begin to do and say things in the name of God, which are satanic. This is Satan deceiving in the world. And this is something that most of everybody has fallen into. Stick with Jesus. Stick with God's agape love. And ask for the Spirit to rightly divide the word of truth for you. And you won't be able to go wrong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for seeing us do another Bible study. We thank you for providing one. We thank you for your Spirit to strengthen us. We ask, Lord, that for the rest of the Sabbath day, you would just fill us with peace, love, joy, and bless all those who watch this, who are with us, and who will watch it. So thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate y'all.